Those are good, Brooklyn. Amen. Well, Brother Cody Shoes, an evangelist, and he's going to be preaching for us this morning. And wouldn't like to invite him up here. Ask God to bless him and anoint him. Any preacher that's ever been in this pulpit or any pulpit, he wants the Holy Spirit to move in his soul and his heart and to anoint the word as it goes forth. I don't remember if you move around or not, but if you do, we've got a portable mic. For Whatever you want to preach, I can stand behind the pulpit. That's fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll do that. All right, good. God bless you. Preacher, thank God amen. for you. Amen. amen. Are you glad to be in church today? Say amen. amen. I appreciate the goodness of the Lord and his uh, mercy and grace upon my life. It is a joy to be back at Temple again. I love your pastor. He's always been so gracious and so kind to me, and I appreciate the opportunity to stand this morning and preach the word of the Lord. And for those of you that may not know me, my name is Cody Shue, and uh, I've just, uh, the Lord saved me when I was seven, called me to preach at the age of 17, put me in full-time evangelism at the age of 21, and I served there for about 13 years, a little over 13 years in full-time evangelism. And then just this past January, uh, the Lord has given me the privilege to begin pastoring my home church, the Pisgah Baptist Church in Lenore. And I had a busy year because I got married to my best friend last October. And uh, last year when Pastor Lawson had us come in, she was sick and unable to be with us. Uh, but I appreciate the will of God and uh, his mercy and the just opportunity to serve him. And I say this, a lot of the young people uh, think they're gonna grow old and by themselves, but I say this, it is worth the wait to find the right mate. And uh, thank the Lord for that. Had a busy year, no doubt about that, but I thank the Lord for his grace and just the privilege to come by here on my way to heaven. We'll be in Genesis 22 this morning. Genesis 22, and as you're finding your place in the word of the Lord, I say I appreciate your pastor, what he means to me. Uh, he'll never know on this side of heaven how much of an impact he has been in my life as well as a lot of the preachers in our area in western North Carolina. And I appreciate you, Pastor, for your love for the Lord, your love for the Word. And uh, he has taught me a lot of uh, not necessarily just what to think, but he has taught me how to think and uh, taught me that it is absolutely legal to think. And I appreciate that. Uh, Baptists sometimes believe contrary to that, but I love you, preacher. Thank you for the joy it is to be here. Uh, good to be in the Lord's house today. Genesis chapter number 22. I'll begin reading in verse number nine. Do pray for me today. I desire to be a help and a blessing to you. Genesis 22, verse nine. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram called in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. I'd like to call your attention to verse 14, that name of God, Jehovah-Jireh. That's exactly what I desire to preach for just a few moments this morning. Father, we are grateful for the privilege it is to be an old-time Christian. We thank you for this dear man of God and his precious wife and what they mean to my wife and I. Thank you for this place and all that you have accomplished down through the years. I pray that you'd help us now. I pray for a fresh anointing. I pray that you'd navigate me through the message today. Lord, calm my nerves. You know how nervous I am, Lord, to be in the presence of these people. And such a great man of God as Pastor Lawson, I pray that you'd help me now to preach your word. We we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. 
The name of God is a mystery to all humanity. God has given his name to the ancient Hebrews of old, but that name is so sacred and so holy that there has never been a Gentile ear ever hear a Hebrew utter this most holy name of God. Theological scholarship notes this as the Tetragrammaton. But in studying your Bible, you'll find that God has given himself many names. The names that God has given himself, they are not to benefit God, but rather they are to benefit humanity. For every name that God has given himself, it is a revelation into who God is. And studying your Bible, you'll find that God would give himself a name in accordance to the need of his people. What I mean by that is in studying the history of the Israelites, when the people of God had a specific need, God would reveal himself by a specific name. The definition of that name would be exactly what the people of God needed in that moment of time. God doing this was teaching his people that whatever they would need in life was exactly who that he is. So it was in the life of Brother Abraham in Genesis 17, 1, there God reveals himself to Abraham as Almighty God. Almighty God is the Hebrew name El Shaddai defined as the breasted one. Why would God reveal himself as El Shaddai, the breasted one? It was in accordance to the need of Brother Abraham. Genesis 17, 1, it would be safe in saying that the nation of Israel was a newborn nation. It was an infant nation. What is the greatest need of a newborn infant? It is that of nourishment from its mother's breast. God revealing himself to Abraham as El Shaddai, the breasted one, was testifying to Abraham that the nourishment that the nation would need to prosper and grow and be successful would come from none other source than Almighty God himself. And so it was again in Genesis 22. God is yet again revealing himself to brother Abraham. This time it is a top Mount Moriah. This time it is the name Jehovah Jireh. If you have a study edition of the Bible, somewhere in the proximity of the name Jehovah Jireh, you'll have the definition something like the Lord will provide or the Lord that provides. And that is an accurate assessment. But when you zero in on the name Jireh, not only does it carry the idea of one that provides, but it carries the idea of one who has the ability to see and provide. God revealing himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh was testifying that he is the Lord that sees the need of his people and not only does he see the need of his people, he provides a remedy for that need because that's just who he is. When, what's interesting about this is when you come to Exodus chapter number six, God is having a conversation with brother Moses about brother Abraham. Exodus 6, God tells Brother Moses that he was not known by Abraham by the name Jehovah. He was not known by Abraham by that name Jehovah. Now, some would look at Genesis 22 and Exodus 6 and say, well, that is a contradiction in Scripture. But you know just as well as I do, there are no contradictions in your King James Bible. We have to look at the context. Abraham was aware of the name Jehovah but what the word of God is teaching us in Exodus 6 is that Abraham did not understand the definition of the name Jehovah he was aware of it but he did not completely understand it in its entirety in our text in Genesis 22 when God revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh no doubt Abraham scratched his head what in the world was God meaning by this most sacred and most holy name? But God was revealing himself to Abraham in a light that Abraham could not completely understand. Why? 
because on this day God saw something that Abraham could not see because he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides. Right quickly, let's look in our text in Genesis 22 and I want to show you three things right off the page of your Bible concerning this name Jehovah Jireh and I'll take my seat. First of all, let's notice the purpose found in Genesis 22. Now, it is that famous passage of scripture where God is requiring uh, brother Abraham to walk up Mount Moriah and to sacrifice his son Isaac. Why would God require this of a brother Abraham? The answer is found in verse one, that God did tempt Abraham. As students to the Bible, you know this word tempt does not mean that God was trying to trip Abraham Abraham up. He was not trying to be a stumbling block and get Abraham to fall into sin. That's not the word tempt. But tempt here means to test. It means to prove. What was God proving in Abraham? It was his faith. God knew he was going to use Abraham to be the father of the nation of Israel. God knew that Abraham was to be the father of faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter number 11. Last time I checked, if you're to be the father of faith, you must first have faith and have that faith put to the test. God saw a need in the life of Abraham that was faith. And not only did God see the need he remedied that need and God created a mount of testing for Abraham that would prove his faith that would test his faith God saw what Abraham needed and he provided a remedy for that need because he is Jehovah Jireh the Lord that sees and provides we've all heard the cliche but it stands true that on this day God was not interested in Isaac but rather God God was interested in all of Abraham. So it is in our Christian experience, there will be times in our life if we desire to go to the next level with God, that God will require an Isaac of you and I. It may be a hobby, it may be a job, it may be a relationship of some sort, but something that we love and we cherish, God will require us to lay that Isaac down. And in those moments of time, God is not interested in our Isaac, but God is interested in having all of you and I and us being obedient unto the will of God. God knows exactly what we need to be conformed into the image of his son. He sees our need and he provides that need. He designs those storms. He designs those valleys. He designs those battles because he knows exactly what we need to look more like him because he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides. Not only notice the purpose, but secondly, notice the provision in this text. The provision is predicated of the need. What is the need? It is that of a sacrifice we learn in verse number 7. It is that of a sacrifice. Genesis 22 gives us a glimpse. It is a foreshadowing of the cross of Calvary. It provides us a glimpse of what the Lord Jesus Christ would do for you and I and the sins of the world. Notice your Bible in verse 2. Abraham is to sacrifice his only son. Exactly what God would do. Verse number 4. Abraham... And uh, Isaac would travel some three days. Verse 5, Abraham declared that he and the lad would go yonder and worship. But he said they both would return, believing that he knew he was to sacrifice his, his son. But he believed God so much that when he sacrificed his son, he believed God would raise him up again. All a picture of the resurrection. Verse number 7, Isaac said, hey, daddy, We've got the fire. 
We've got the wood, but where is the lamb? Verse number eight, Abraham declared, God will provide himself a lamb. Now, I don't know. You may disagree with me. That's okay. But in the sincerity looking at verse eight, I don't really believe that Abraham understood the weight of prophecy that would be intermingled in verse number eight. I believe Abraham was in sincerity in that moment looking in his son's eyes with a broken heart knowing the requirement that God had required of him I don't think Abraham saw me and you I don't think Abraham saw the sins of the world but he looked in the eyes of his son with a broken heart and said son God will provide himself a lamb but what Abraham could not see was some 1700 years later on the muddy banks of the Jordan River John the Baptist would declare behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Verse number 13, a ram called in the thicket. Abraham sacrificed this ram in the stead of his son. So once again in scripture, we have a substitutionary sacrifice for the atonement of sin. All a picture of Calvary, all a picture of what Christ would do for you and I. So when we look at the purpose and we look at the provision. It leads me to my third and final point and what I want to spend my time on this morning, and that is the place. As you look in these first 14 verses of Genesis 22, God is dogmatic about the precise geographical location that Abraham is to sacrifice his son. Verse 2, he commands him to go to the land of Moriah. And there he tells him he would point out one specific mountain, one mountain the Bible said. And there God would tell him. Verse number four, as Abraham and his son are traveling, the Bible said that Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Somehow, God pointed out to Abraham, this is the specific location you are to sacrifice your son. What's the big deal? Out of all the thousands of hillsides, all of the thousands of mountainsides in this region of the world, what's the big deal about this one precise location? Keep in mind, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides. God had this place designated because he saw something that Abraham could not see. With that in mind, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And very hurriedly, we'll trace this crimson thread through our Bible. 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and beginning in verse number 18. We are fast forwarding some 700 years from the days of Abraham and Isaac atop Mount Moriah. David is now king of Israel. David has sinned greatly before the Lord. He has numbered the people all a, a sin of pride, if you will. God is bringing judgment upon the people and David is saying, Lord, it's not their fault. I'm the one that sinned. Don't judge them, judge me. So God sent the prophet Gad down to David's house with a word from the Lord. God sent the message that there is a mountain overlooking Jerusalem. It is owned by Jebusite, whose name is Ornan. He uses this mountain as a threshing floor for wheat. God is telling David, you need to go purchase this mountain. There, build an altar and their sacrifice for an atonement for your sin. Verse 25 of First Chronicles 21, David purchases this threshing floor of wheat from Ornan the Jebusite for some 600 shekels of gold. There he built an altar, their blood was shed, and once again there was a substitutionary sacrifice for the atonement of sin. What's the big deal about that? On the same location that God required Abraham to sacrifice is the same location that God required 
David to sacrifice. Fast forward with me just a few years to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1. David has now died. He has been followed by his son Solomon. Solomon is known throughout world history for many, many things. But one thing Solomon is remembered for is building the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. The same location Abraham was to sacrifice was the same location David was to sacrifice. The same location that God required Solomon to build the temple. Students of the Bible you're aware you have the holy place and behind the veil you have the holies of holies uh, where the ark of the covenant would reside and there on the great day of atonement the high priest would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat atonement for the sins of the people. On the same mountainside, blood was shed in Abraham's day was the same location that blood was shed in David's day. On that same location, the temple was built and yet once again, blood was shed as a substitutionary sacrifice for the atonement of man's sin. One more time, John chapter 19, I promise I'm done. John 19, we are fast forwarding 1,000 years from the days of Solomon. John 19, verse number 17. And he, speaking of the Lord Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Galgotha, where they crucified him. If you were to have a snapshot of the city of Jerusalem during the time period of the crucifixion of our Savior, you would see a temple. It was not Solomon's temple, for it was destroyed, but rather it was Herod's temple built on the same location. Scholars teach us that less than 300 yards from the Temple Mount, some 300 yards from Herod's Temple, was this place known as Golgotha. We know it as Mount Calvary, where the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of the world. That on the same mountain, God required Abraham to sacrifice, was the same mountain God required David to sacrifice. On the same mountain Solomon was required to sacrifice and on that same mountainside the Lord Jesus Christ willingly laid down his life as a substitutionary sacrifice for the atonement of man's sin when we could not get to God God made a way to get to us and he remedied our need through the cross on this day in Genesis 22 God testing the faith of brother Abraham God revealed himself to Abraham as the name Jehovah Jireh. No doubt Abraham scratched his head and wondered what in the world was almighty God speaking about in that moment. But what Abraham could not see is that God saw beyond him and he saw the need of all humanity. In Genesis 22, all Abraham saw was a mountain that would test his faith. In 1 Chronicles 21, all David saw was a threshing floor of wheat, an odor and a place to get forgiveness. And 2 Chronicles 3, all Solomon saw was a level place to build the temple. Uh, but I'm glad that God saw beyond Abraham and God saw beyond David and God saw beyond Solomon. What did he see, preacher? He saw you and he saw me and he saw the sins of mankind because he saw our need. And not only did he see our need, he he remedied our need through the old rugged cross and everything we'll ever need, everything we'll ever desire is found in the cross of Calvary. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides, he not only saw it, he remedied that need. Have you ever gave much thought that before anything ever was, God was? 
Have you ever gave much thought that before Genesis 1-1, God was? Before anything ever existed, God was. Before the stars were sprinkled in the sky, before the sun was ever set ablaze, before this mud ball that we call earth was created and set on its axis, God was. And not only God was, but God saw. Before anything was, he saw. He saw his creation. He saw the fall of man. He saw your need and he saw my need. He saw the need of humanity. Not only did he see our need, but he was going to remedy our need through the old rugged cross. Why God was hollowing out the valleys and setting the streams in motion. The Middle East, God made a mountain. Abraham would know that mountain is Mount Moriah. The Jews later on would know it as Mount Zion, but you and I would know it as Mount Calvary. And somewhere in the proximity of that mountain, God planted a seed in the ground. And from that seed, a tree would grow. And from that tree, an old rugged cross would be hewn. And it was upon that cross that Almighty God would willingly sacrifice his only begotten son for the needs of mankind. Amen. He saw our need, but not only did he see our need, but he remedied our need through the cross. And whatever your need is, in, whatever your need is this morning, if it's salvation, I point you to the cross. If it's sanctification, I point you to the cross. If it's encouragement, I point you to the cross. Because Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides, He saw your need before you ever came to church today, and He remedied that need through the cross Amen. several years ago. I was required to lay down an Isaac. Been seven, eight years ago now, and uh, at the time, it was the most challenging thing spiritually the Lord has ever asked me to do. And uh, I'll never forget that my immediate reaction after laying that Isaac down, God giving me the faith and and the courage to do so, I rejoiced in the will of God, rejoiced in victory. And I made up my mind for the weeks that followed that decision that I was going to worship God and I worshiped God till I was physically exhausted, rejoicing in God's will for my life. But y'all probably don't have this problem in Tennessee, but I got a problem over in North Carolina. It's called my flesh. Y'all know anything about that? And I started having some issues with, with my flesh. And uh, I, I remember I was getting, uh, I started getting real depressed. Started fighting depression. And it went on for about two years, fighting depression. And it got really, it got really bad. I was still preaching, trying to serve God, trying to help people and still putting that smile on. You know what I'm talking about, but I still... I still struggled. I was a broken man on the inside. I'd read, read my Bible and it felt like reading a newspaper. Go to my prayer place and feel like God was a million miles away. Go to church and try to get under good preaching and just dry and still. Everybody else shouting. Everybody else worshiping. I was struggling. There's one, there's one place on the coast of South Carolina outside the Charleston area that's always been partial to me. I love the low country. And uh, I'll never forget, I woke up early one morning and it dawned on me I've tried everything else. I've went to the mountains, I've went to my prayer place, I've went everywhere I could to try to find some relief and find God, but I couldn't find no relief anywhere. Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, once you drive down there, God's met with you there on that seashore, real remote location. I said, all right. So I loaded up, drove the five and a half hours down there from home. And I was walking, I was walking out on, on the beach, on the, on the shoreline, and I realized 
that I had forgotten my chair. I drove all the way down there to sit and muse and meditate on the Lord and I forgot my chair. So I was really excited about that and I was kicking sand like forgot my stinking chair and I was upset and I was singing the blues and I got out there on, on the shoreline and I thought I'll just sit, I'll just sit in the sand, you know. And, and the Lord called my attention. There was, a, there was a big old tree trunk, literally a big old huge tree, driftwood washed up on the shoreline. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, hey, just sit on that tree right there. I said, all right. As I was walking to the tree, the Holy Spirit reminded me. Now, this is, I'm not trying to be super spiritual. This just happened in my life. I'm not exaggerating. This is what happened. He said, matter of fact, every need you've ever had in your whole life has been supplied because of a tree. And as I sat on that tree trunk for over four hours the Holy Spirit reminded me of the sufferings of Calvary. That what I was going through paled in comparison to what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for me. I don't know what you're dealing with or what you're going through, but I guarantee you what you're facing right now, I'm sure it's bad, but I'm sure it's nothing compared to what Jesus suffered for you. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides, he saw our need and he has remedied our need through the cross. If there's anything I can do, I just point you to him. Amen. Father, we are grateful this morning for your word. Thank you for seeing our need and thank you for remedying our need. Thank you for supplying every need. Thank you for this time together. Pray you bless the invitation. Lord, if there'd be one here that doesn't know you as their Savior, may today be the day they call on you for salvation. I pray for my brothers and sisters that may be struggling, that may be weary and well-doing. Lord, may they catch a glimpse of the cross. May they find encouragement. Thank you for not only seeing our need, but thank you for remedying our need on the cross. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. He has no idea, but that's exactly what God gave me. I needed what he had to say. I said, Lord, give me something from this preacher when he gets here on Sunday morning. And did he ever. Amen. I don't know about you, but no message has ever been preached that spoke more directly to my heart than what I just heard. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. He comes through when you need him the most. He has a way of being there, and he says what needs to be said in such a fashion that there's no denying it. No denying it. There's no coincidence in this. There's no denying. That was for me. Let's stand up this morning. Page 410 in the church hymnal. Page 410, church hymnal. Yes, sir. Have you, has your faith ever been put to the test? Amen. Have you ever struggled? It just seems like it's a, it's a war of attrition. No major battles to win. It's just gnawing and eating and pecking and sniping at you. That's the way Satan works. That's the way he works. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Whether anybody else got anything out of that or not, I did. <laughs> Amen. Go ahead, brother. Jesus, keep me <clears throat> near the cross, bear a precious fountain, free to walk a healing stream, flow from Calvary's mountain. In the cross. He preached Christ to you this morning.
Now let me say something to you. He said something in that message that spoke directly to me. Not only how you are, but I listen to preaching. That's why I sit down here when he's up here preaching. See, I don't sit up here while he's preaching. I sit down there because I want him to preach to me too. And here's what he said. He said, God wants to take you to another level. He wants to raise you up higher. He wants to get you to where he can talk to you in a way that he hadn't talked to you before. Show you things he hadn't showed you before. Use you in ways he'd never used you before. But he'll put you through a test when he does that. Now how many of you got a hold of that? <laughs> well I did. <laughs> Thank you. Sing another verse. Brother. Near the cross a trembling soul Love and mercy found me. Bear the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. Amen. Tell you something, I appreciate this brother. Amen. I really do. I really do. I appreciate him. Folks, uh, for his age, he's got a lot of wisdom. Amen. Let me tell you now, he's got a lot of wisdom. And uh, intelligence is a good thing. You need to be smart. That's good. That's a great blessing, great help. It's good to know how to read, <laughs> all that. But he's got wisdom. That comes from God, that's a gift from God. My prayer is, as a pastor of this assembly, is that you grow. Grow in the Lord. Learn how to discern spirits. Have you done that? Amen. For your own good. Grow. Learn how to discern them. It'll make all the difference in the world in your spiritual life and your walk with God. Learn how to do that. And you'll be amazed at what a difference it'll make for you. It'll, uh, it'll have a great effect on the choices you make. Because how many have, how many have learned that wrong choices have bad ramifications. Amen. Wrong choices. <laughs> wrong choices. <clears throat> so pray, to, pray the good Lord gives you the wisdom to make the right choices, and that comes through discernment. Let's have a couple of people go down the back, go to the back door and take up an offering for this brother. Amen. He's pastoring now, and he's gracious to come, and he's gracious to come and preach for us here on Sunday morning and Sunday night. I think that's awful nice of him to do that, don't you? And if you move to North Carolina, find out where he is. Amen. Because that's going to be a church you want to go to. Amen. That's where you want to go to church. Amen. You better believe it. Yes, sir. Now, you know, his wife, his wife was in a pretty serious accident. And she was, you know, what you call T-boned. She was hit from the side on her side of the car and it threw her head against the window and she got a concussion from it. And I got on the internet and did a little research into concussions to find out what we're dealing with here. And they can be severe. It can take years to get over concussions in some cases. And they continue to nag at you and gnaw at you. But she is doing real well. And we thank the good Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir? Now, folks, if you want to come at 5 o'clock and pray, the doors are opened. If you can't make it at 5 o'clock, that's fine. What this brother's doing is coming here at 5 o'clock, and if you'd like to come at 5 o'clock and pray, that's, that's good. No question about that. It would be nice if you could come in here at 1 o'clock in the morning and pray and not have to worry about some thief coming in and hauling off everything you've got where the church doors are open 24-7.
that would be wonderful, but we don't live in that world anymore. They'll rob you blind in, in the church house. But if five o'clock, you're welcome. This brother invites you to come. If your schedule keeps you from doing it, that's fine. But he's here, and if you can come, that'd be good. Yes, sir. Pastor, we'd like to invite all the visitors that came today that you went with us at the church. Now you go. Reading, and so we'd like to invite all the visitors to come up and share your bread. Good home cooked food, folks. Amen. So you're welcome to come up and eat with us and, uh, and fellowship. So uh, we, we love our visitors. Yes. It's a big deal. We, we, we love you, and we're glad you came. And so many of them come off of the Internet where they're watching YouTube and so forth. We have visitors that come from the local area, and, uh, and, and for various reasons, whatever they may be. It may, it, the reason's really not all that important. In fact, you're here, and we're glad to have you here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, brother. Amen. Yes, sir. And keep praying for Brother Tekel. He's had an awful lot of physical problems. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you know what's going on over there or not, but uh, Hamas has invaded that country. It's literally a military assault. They've killed hundreds. Hundreds of people have been killed now. They're dragging women and children into the streets and murdering them in front, of their, in front of their friends, cutting their throats and blowing their brains out. I know that's shocking stuff, but that's what's going on. These are called war crimes. This is what Munich was about at the end of World War II when they tried them by war. They were war criminals, all right? When you start dragging women and children out into the street, I'm not interested in what you believe and what you're standing for. You're a murderer. You're a murderer, and these murderers will be tried, I hope, and be brought to justice. All right, let's pray, and we'll let you go. God bless you. Meet again at 7, 6 o'clock. Yes, sir. Yes. She had that surgery on her eye. She had a wandering eye. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Lead us in prayer. Dismiss us. Would you do that?